Good morning, everybody. I'm Travis Shaddix. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. Thank you all for being here on uh, a very sunny, beautiful day in Lexington, Kentucky. A little cold. It actually had some snow flurries a day or two ago here. But it's going to warm right back up, I think. Well, I lie. It's actually going to be a little cold the day, next day or two, but then it's going to get up in the 60s and so forth. So if you're new to the channel, this channel tries to find out how we know what we know about turf grass science. Many times we find that what we know is true. Sometimes we find what we know is probably not. <laughs> and that is becoming painfully obvious in some of the comments I'm receiving on some of my articles. Um, my my videos. The uh, vast majority of all of my audience is extremely kind and very flattering and very appreciative of what, what they find here. But as the channel grows, inevitably, there's going to be one or two people who uh, have a different take. <laughs> and that's becoming obvious. <clears throat> Usually the uh, the sales folks and the YouTube BS artists don't usually take too kindly to my content. But as I've said numerous times, and if you're new to the channel, this will be the first time you hear it, but the, the, the senior audience is going to know they've heard this many times. I'm not saying this stuff from my research. I'm just communicating the research the best way I know how. So if you get a little perturbed by it, just remember it's not me, it's the research. And if you want to disagree with the research, publish your research, enter it into the scientific literature and we'll discuss it. So, uh, been enlightening reading some comments the last day or two. It's usually coming from people who, for some reason, have a vested interest in and what they're doing and what I'm communicating is oftentimes in conflict with what they're doing. <laughs> so what can I tell you? The research is, the evidence is what it is. And the um, best advice I can give you is to follow the evidence. You're more likely to be, act, be correct if you do that than if you start putting out nonsensical information on YouTube because you did something in your backyard and you thought you found something. I do not apologize for communicating the evidence, and I never will. It is what it is. Um, the chat, the reason I'm late is because the chat is for some reason not working. And so I had to go back to the old chat for today until I figure out the problem. One of the many examples of my incompetency on, on YouTube and the IT technical information and whatever you got to do. So for today, the chat's going to go back to the old, the old way it used to be until I figure out what went wrong. I had a good conversation with Dr. Woods yesterday. If you didn't see that episode, I encourage you to go back and watch it. I, I didn't, I haven't actually watched it. Um, I watched a small portion of it because I think I said something wrong. And I realized we got, a, well, I got a little nerdy on it. So sorry if it went a little bit too far down the rabbit hole in terms of scientific technicalities, but um, sometimes that happens with me when I get around other people who are interested in the same things I'm interested in. So uh, it was a fun episode, fun fun conversation. I like it when we just have conversations about turf grass. I mean, I, I don't mind going through the articles and reading the articles, that's, that's good too. But I really am more interested about the researchers themselves and why they did what they did and, you know, the story behind it is kind of what I'm interested in when I have those people on and, I'm, and Dr. Woods is, was fit right in line. I mean, he, had a very good conversation and uh, I appreciate his time. Good morning, Super TA, and Mr. Lush Lons, Connecticut Cubonican. Another, oh, another great show yesterday with two Hall of Famers. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. You just reduced three quarters of a pound of K from your, your home lawn. Blessed to be a member of the best channel on YouTube. Well, thank you so much. You're so kind. Thank you. Well, I do my best. <laughs> Randy? Andrew Burris, Internet Surfer, Brady, Transitioning Zone Guy. Andrew says that I am just the messenger. Yeah, you know, you, you can tell when I opine. You know, it's pretty obvious when I kind of go off and have an, a 
opinion about something. Um, you know, and my opinion is just that. It's just an opinion. Um, my opinion might, I don't know, might mean more to some because of my expertise in this particular area. But it could be wrong. The, the literature could be wrong. The evidence that's, that I go over, off, you know, oftentimes I've mentioned in some papers that these conclusions are just flawed. You know, there's been two or three papers like that. So there's no assurance that the information I go over is absolutely true. It just, we're more likely to be correct by following the evidence published in literature than, than if we don't follow that. And certainly opinions that exist at the bottom of that hierarchy of evidence could be correct. It could be true, but I don't, I'm not really interested in going and discussing and arguing those sorts of opinions and those, what you did or didn't do, or you, what you found or what your grandma, grandma, or grandpa did or whatever. I'm not so much interested in that as I am evidence. And so when we publish it, then we can start discussing things. So, um, anyway, I just, there's been a couple of YouTubers who, <laughs> what can I say? They, uh, they seem uninterested in spending time reading the literature because they say they don't have enough time. They, they want me to reduce the content and just get to the point. And, um, and that's fine. But instead of going out and reading the literature, which I understand is challenging, you don't always have access to it. So I have this channel to kind of help provide that content to the people who could, you know, are interested in it. Maybe they can better understand it and have access. But if you don't want to do that, because you don't have time, you say you don't have time, you don't want to spend an hour or whatever, that's fine, whatever. But don't tell me you don't have time when you spend two or three hours doing a video on nonsense in your backyard. <laughs> and then you publish and say, you should apply potassium and potassium is the greatest element, you know, ever invented. You'll spend two, three hours doing a video and editing it, but you won't spend an hour watching this to get, to get the truth. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a bad argument in my view. Uh, Randy says, I'm the man in the middle. There's, there is a tech called, there is an attack called that way. On, on cryptography, there is, I'm um, sorry, I missed something there on that, that translation there, Randy. Apologize. And there it is, our middle name. So anyway, good morning, Brett. So apologize about the chat. It's going to look like it used to until I figure out what went wrong. Sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. So let's go to, I have a video today. It's a short little video. And we're going to get into some, some potassium on centipede grass. My least favorite grass, probably. But it is what it is. People seem to be interested in warm season grasses. And I go over uh, both grasses. And if you have an interest in warm season grasses, just go to the channel and select the warm season grass playlist. Because I get often accused of not going over warm season grasses, which is true. I generally will go over cool season grasses just because the literature is, has more content on cool season grasses than warm season grasses in, in many regards. Um, but about a third of the content, when it, whether it's cool season or warm season, about a third of it right now is on warm season grasses. So feel free to go there. And that mention that that reminds me, I, you know, I, I don't I don't know what else to say to the the members of the channel other than I, I'm thank you. I'm I'm shocked. I I don't know. Um, I, I didn't expect to have anybody watching the channel full stop. Much less people um voluntarily contributing to keeping the channel going by being a member and i think there's 22 members now and if that stays where it is then the just the revenue from those members is from my just initial estimation is covering the expenses to keep the channel on air I, I, I don't, I'm just surprised. I don't know. I didn't expect that at all. And I, like I said, I've almost, I almost didn't do the channel at all. I almost didn't do memberships at all. I just didn't think there'd be any interest in it. And clearly I was wrong. So thank you to my members. Uh, thank you to you all who are watching. And I just, I don't know what else to say other than thank you. I, I, I didn't expect it. And so w with the members we have now, like I said, I'm I pretty much am paying for all the expenses to keep it on air and keep it running. And so it's looking bright for the future to have some revenue available to help offset some of the expenses for my research that I do on turf. And so, um, which, you know, 
isn't chump change. It's real money. And um, so maybe this is where it's going. Maybe there'll be enough revenue to help support some of the expenses of some of the soul testing research that I'm doing right now and sulfur publications that I'm trying to get published. And there's all sorts of little questions I have to ask. There's a, there's a really large study that I it would be never be able to fund on a, on a YouTube revenue. It's, it's way too expensive, but um, there's those projects are in my mind about future work and so forth. So it has to do with soil sampling and various tests and so forth. So anyway, thank you. That's all I can tell you. I, I, I don't know what else to say other than I just, I'm genuinely uh, amazed that there is even one member, but there's already 22 and I've only had it open for a week. So thank you. Um, let's get into the video. There's a video about potassium and honestly, I Googled, um, Googled or whatever, YouTube or whatever potassium and lawns or turf grass potassium or whatever. And honestly, there's probably a hundred videos on potassium, but I do feel a little bit, um, I feel a little bad if I continue to use the same YouTube BS artists over and over and over. It seems like I'm attacking them or something. It's not my intent to, to, to have them feel that way. But there's just so much nonsense, usually by the same YouTube channels. It's like, well, they got caught in my algorithm and they can't get out. <laughs> okay, So I decided to go with a different video today. But, you know, I could just close my eyes and pick one on YouTube and it's going to be a nonsensical potassium video from some YouTuber. Uh, it, there, there's that many of them out there. This one, I, 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 it popped up on my channel, I think actually this morning or, or late last night, I can't remember. And it's, it's not, I, I don't, he's not very well known as far as I know. Um, it's by a channel called urban dad lawn care. And it's the same nonsensical BS as any of the other potassium videos you'll find on YouTube. So I just thought I would use this just as a means of changing it up a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I have no problem attacking the claims, but I also don't want to have any ill will or have the YouTuber harassed or something because, you know, their content is ridiculous and I'm constantly showing their videos and that's not my intent. And I have a concern about that. I, I don't want them to you know, be harassed by anybody because of what something that I've done. So I'm sharing the sharing the love, I guess. <laughs> um, oh, Mr. Lush Lawn says, oh, and and th thanks, Mr. Lush or uh, Lawn. The um, on my normal chat, this would have popped up. It looks like you contributed five dollars in a super chat, or I believe that's what that is. If that is, then you're the first. Thank you. In my normal chat, it would have popped up. But because I'm incompetent on this, it, I, I have the old chat and it didn't come up. But those in the, in the YouTube chat, if you can see the live chat, you can see he donated. So thank you very much, Lush. I appreciate it. Internet, let's go there and look at the YouTube. It's very short. It's four minutes. We're not going to watch the whole thing. But um, let's listen to what the Urban Dad Lawn Care has to say about potassium and lawns. You did your soil test. It said you're low in potassium. What can you do to raise those levels? Now that is about as straight to the point as you can get when it comes to how potassium is over applied in, in turf grass management. They go to a soil test and, and how many of the past video or past papers have I gone over where in the paper it says Medic 3 soil test apparently is not an appropriate extraction for potassium in these sand soils. The, the paper yesterday with Dr. Woods um, said it in a softer language. The Destin Gallard paper, I believe, concluded that. The Beer paper concluded that, that these tests are not particularly useful when the soils contain iron, uh, potassium bearing minerals. And the first thing out of the bag, you took a soil test and it says you're low, so you're going to apply it. This is what I'm trying to communicate to people when it comes to nutrient management is soil testing can be useful in some cases. But this is the way people use it. And this is not useful. Taking a soil test, looking at a number and going, yep, you need to apply potassium. That's not useful. It's not, it's not based on evidence. Okay. There are clearly some cases where that value on a soil test with potassium 
can be useful to guide you. But this is not the way. <laughs> Just blows me away. Well, it's your lucky day because in this video, I'm going to show you a couple of easy ways that you can add potassium to your lawn. Potassium plays an important role in the life cycle of your lawn. Yeah, so this often, and th this is this concept or this um, mindset, it permeates marketing. And I want to. I want to spend a little time on this uh, to see if you all can catch the flaw. Okay, so let me take back it up about five seconds and see if you can catch the flaw that just is, prim and in my opinion, primarily responsible for the over-application, in, well, in this case, of potassium. Let's listen to it last five seconds. Is an important role in the Whoop, life whoops. potassium plays an important role in the life cycle of your lawn. It gives your lawn the strength it needs to fight off stress, drought, and disease. And potassium also helps in better nutrient and water uptake, while also helping synthesize proteins and starches. The symptoms. Okay. So, this is epistemology. We're learning critical thinking skills. Okay, that's sort of an underlying objective of the channel. And what he said was potassium, well, let's just go back just a couple seconds right here. Potassium plays an important role in the life cycle of your lawn. Potassium plays an important role in the life cycle of your lawn. I, I'm not sure if you would ever in our, going back to two or 300 years to the point where, I mean, whenever potassium first became known as a, as a plant essential element, Whenever that was, say 100 years ago, 200 years ago, when I can't even remember the date. I don't sh I'm not sure you'll find a scientist anywhere who would disagree with that. Potassium plays an important role in your life cycle, your lawn. That's the red herring. And, and I, want, I want to use that as an example, and I've used it before, where when someone says this, of course it's true. I mean, no one's going to disagree with that. Potassium plays an important role. But that's not the point. That's not what we're talking about. That's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in, and what I hope you're interested in, is not potassium plays an important role. It's what does applied potassium do? What does the potassium I paid for and hired guys to go out and spread, or gals to go out and spread, and I'm talking to my clients and charging my clients for, or the golf pro, and I'm including potassium, or the, the members of the, you know, whatever athletic club, or the coaches or the players, that I'm telling them, hey, I'm doing this. What does the applied potassium do? It's a very, very common red herring. And, it's, and, and what happens is, in, at least in my experience, is that when someone says that, you go, oh, okay, well, that's true. I agree with that. And then you start listening to him and you start going down the wrong road. And then the next thing he says, it's human nature. You're kind of inclined, well, okay, that's probably true too. And next thing you know, you're down this road that had nothing to do with the direction we need to go. The direction we need to go is what occurs with the applied nutrient. Okay. So we continue. I just wanted to make sure that's clear. And I've, I've shown that before, but it, you can, I could pull up 15 videos, probably 115 videos that use that same, probably unknown, probably un, they don't even realize what they're doing. Uh, but marketing oftentimes does. They're just, oh, well, this, this is, it's useful. Nitrogen is a useful element. Yeah, I know it is. Potassium is useful. Yeah, I know it is. Okay. I'm not, I don't care about that. <laughs> what does the applied nutrient do? Keep going. Starches. The symptoms of a possible potassium deficiency in your lawn include slow growth or poor root and stem development, your lawn becomes more susceptible to temperature changes, and the grass's immunity to disease, harsh weather and drought decreases, and chlorosis, a oh. yellowing of the leaves can occur. If you have low soil pH... Okay, so um, before we get to the pH, I'm going to ask my audience a favor... I don't know how to use like that way back machine or how to go back in time and pull stuff out of the, every of, of sites. I don't know how to do that, but I have a photograph of 
potassium deficiency, a very clear and clean photograph of a potassium deficiency in St. Augustine grass. And I had it as my avatar or little icon symbol on my Twitter account for like six years. And I took it off around 2018 or 17, something like that. Or maybe, maybe 19. I don't remember. And I don't know how to go. I, I lost the photograph. I can't find it. So I was going to show this photograph of what a potassium deficiency actually looks like. Because what he said is mostly, mostly ridiculous. Um, so I was going to show it. I can't find it. So if anybody in my, my audience knows how to use the Wayback Machine or what, however these people pull up these past, um, I don't know, past resources, could you do that for me? Go back to my Twitter account and look at the icon, the little, you know, where norm, some people put their picture. I put a photograph of potassium deficiency and I can't find it. So if you can do that for me and email it to me or put it in chat and link it, or I don't know how you do that, th that stuff, I'd be very grateful. Okay. Because I've got that question so many times about, well, what does a potassium deficiency looks like? And I'll explain it, um, but it doesn't really do it justice until you see it. But basically, potassium deficiency looks a little bit like, at the beginning at least, a little bit like tip burn. The tip of it, um, the tip of the leaf gets a little scorched. And then the ribs or the margins of the leaf become chlorotic. And in severe cases, they turn from yellow even to brownish if it gets really bad. And the middle part of the leaf will still remain green or greener. So it'll go from green and it'll fade into yellow. And in worst case scenarios, it'll actually start to actually scorch the edges of the leaf and the tip of the leaf will be scorched. That occurs on older leaves first, whether it's St. Augustine grass or bent grass or what, or tall, tall fescue or whatever. The potassium is very mobile, so it'll be moved from older leaves into newer leaves as they emerge from the crown. So it's very simple to diagnose it when, once you've been shown it, but clearly a lot of people haven't been shown how to diagnose that. And I would like to do that for you, but I don't have the photograph. So <laughs> please help me find that photograph if you can and, and send it to me. But, the, but anyway, the, the, the grass will generally look a little chlorotic, but if you start looking at the leaves and you pull back the, the, the runners and you look at what number the leaf is from the oldest to the newest, it'll occur on the oldest leaves, as will other nutrient deficiencies. It's not just potassium. But the leaves edges will be scorched with the tips being a little bit chlorotic, even brown in severe cases. Okay. That's a, that's a pretty common sign of potassium deficiency. So don't go by what YouTubers say about potassium deficiencies. I mean, they you generally, I, I haven't really come across a, an explanation that's accurate yet. And I didn't see it in this particular video either. We continue. There is also a direct relationship between soil acidity and potassium availability. So he just showed the pH diagram that I massacred about a month ago. <laughs> that might even be the exact same diagram I used on the channel, where he shows the changes in pH, uh, changes in nutrient solubility. Or actually, I think the diagram says nutrient availability as pH changes. We don't really want to use that much at all. That diagram we don't want to use at all. But we don't, and we want to be aware that nutrient availability or solubility does change with pH. But the plant ha plays a major role in that. So even in cases where the solubility of an element might be low, the uptake of that element from the plant might be high. And I went in those two articles, those two episodes I went over a month or so ago. I provided clear examples of how that can occur, and and, and it's published in the literature. So you know. I don't really take too much um, offense or I don't, I don't really um, feel that then the people that are showing that, P, that pH diagram, I don't, I don't worry about it too much because they just don't know. Oftentimes many, many scientists don't know, uh, but don't, don't hold a lot of confidence in this pH diagram. I would just, the best thing you can do is to actually take it and use it to test your shredder, your paper shredder and your, and your, in your kitchen or your your office and just shred all those diagrams and, and just that's really the best use for it use it for some stuffing in your christmas gifts or something other than that that ph diagram is mostly useless we continue soils with low ph under 6.2 will not only inhibit potassium uptake by the plant but many other key nutrients too yeah that's a that's a common uh opinion that's just his opinion the evidence doesn't support that in many many cases so don't worry about it too much 
I did do a video earlier on my channel about the importance of pH to your lawn. So once you've watched this video, go yeah. check that one out. I, I might Tassie go do that. for your lawn <laughs> comes in a couple of forms and both are used in fertilizers. There's muriate of potash and there's sulfate of potash. So what are the differences between the two? Potassium chloride or muriate of potash is the least expensive of the two, but it has a high salt index and chloride content. Potassium sulfate or sulfate of potash is considered a premium quality potash and contains two key ingredients for your lawn potassium and sulfur SLP is not a naturally occurring mineral and must be produced through resource intensive mm. yeah. methods and processes which makes the SLP fertilizers price higher because of its superior ability in making plants more resilient without adding extra salt to your soil well that's completely nonsense that's complete nonsense without adding extra i mean sop is a salt acl is a salt i mean you're going to add salt one way or the other it's just you're going to add you have a much less risk much lower risk of causing salt problems or burn when you're using sop because the salt content's lower but you're adding salt that's what i'm saying they just say these things they don't know if it's true um let's see continue i gotta skip ahead i'm not gonna show this whole thing but like everything in lawn care, the choice is yours. Use the product that better fits your budget, but just understand the differences between the two forms of potash. And while we're talking about choices... Okay, so that's it, because he's going to start selling stuff on... Uh, not selling stuff, but trying to get people to subscribe. He does go to the application, and he shows one of our uh, common products, which, I, honestly, I would never in my lifetime ever buy a product. From, from this company, not because the product is a bad product. The cost is so far beyond reasonable. I don't know how in the world people get convinced to spend money. It, I, and I bought one just the other day because it's a research project. I'm using it for research, so I'll do it for that. But to spend that on my lawn is absolute madness. And I'm gonna show you what he, which, uh, which, which product he actually uses a couple of ways you can add potassium to your soil the first option you have is using a fertilizer so he's using he's showing on the video for those listening the stress blend from yard mastery there is absolutely nothing unique or special about most of these fertilizers i don't care who you buy it from every now and then you'll find some proprietary coating or something that's mostly marketing agronomically has very little difference between urea or ammonium sulfate or just regular sulfur coated urea but it's all the same stuff you're all getting it from the same manufacturers it's coming from israel or it's coming from canada or it's coming from florida or it's coming from china or it's coming from somewhere on barges it's all the same stuff okay and there's a difference in how they blend it and sometimes they screen the, the fines out and the the, the the larger products out some people spend a little more time in the in the just in the blending of it to make it a little cleaner, but it's all the same stuff. God knows why someone would spend forty dollars for eighteen pounds of just nitrogen and potassium. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would do that. I mean, you can call anybody up, any of these Site One stores or any of the the Harold stores or Howards or any of the distributors. They don't really sell to homeowners directly, but if you call them up and ask for a fifty pound bag, I'm sure they sell it to you. Okay, I don't know why they would you would do this but i mean whatever it is what it is but he's showing the stress blend from yardmaster that has potassium included in the analysis the second option that is available to you is to use straight mlp or slp and i'm going to leave it at that because i don't want to sit here and drag this thing out because i want to spend more time on the article the use of straight sop and straight mop is unwise and i've shown many publications why that is uh, potassium uptake is very um, consistently connected to nitrogen applications um, so we don't really want to go down the road of putting out um, straight potassium unless you have some sort of very specific unique case because we found that a couple things. One, you're probably going to apply many, many, many times more than you ever than the plant can actually take up if you apply straight K. And two, the uptake of whatever K you applied is going to be reduced greatly in the absence of any nitrogen application. 
So it, I doubt very seriously if anybody in your lifetime will ever actually have a confirmed response to potassium, a positive response. It's unlikely. But if you're going to see a response, you're going to see a response when you apply potassium at about half the rate of nitrogen. In some rare cases, it might be a one-to-one -one rate, of, rate of nitrogen in some really rare putting green situations. But usually it's about a two-to-one in decay. Any response you'd see from, from potassium, which I doubt you'd see any, but if you did, it's going to come, it's going to be maximized at that ratio of in, in decay of, of about two to one. And I, I've already shown an article on that back in October or September. I guess it was September. And I'm going to go over that article again, probably on Thursday night. If not, it'll be Monday or Tuesday morning of next week. Okay. So that's that. I just wanted to show that, you know, I appreciate the people's interest in trying to help other people by putting it on YouTube, but honestly, you're not helping. You're, you're, you're messing things up. Just, unless you know what you're talking about, just go about your day. Let the experts be experts. You know, Let the scientists be scientists. And if you want to talk about sharpening your, your blades and you know, putting you know, normal stuff in your lawn and fixing stuff up, that's fine. But when we talk about the science, the, the nutrient response, you know, the, the likelihood of seeing value in your application, uh, I would not go to YouTube for that. <laughs> Okay, I wouldn't even go to YouTube. I wouldn't even go to my YouTube channel for that. I don't go to my YouTube channel for that. I go to the literature for that. I, I start reading scientific papers for that information. So, um, you know, it is what it is. I'll leave it at that. So now what I want to do is since we're 30 minutes into this thing, 40 minutes into this thing, let's, let's go to the scoreboard. And we've been going over potassium, as you all well know. And what I want to do is go to the scoreboard since we did a paper yesterday with Dr. Woods. And we have the turf grass response to apply potassium. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight papers now we've gone over. And in all of those eight papers, they've concluded that there was at least some area where there was no response to applied potassium at all. In three of those eight papers, there was a positive response, and all three coincidentally happened to be with yield. And in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the eight papers, seven of the eight papers. There was a negative response, a harmful response following the application of potassium to turf grass. Now, I put up a poll yesterday on my YouTube community tab, and thank you all for who, who all participated in that. That blew me away in two, in two respects. One, historically, I put a poll occasionally on Twitter ages and ages ago, and I get like 20 or 30 people fill up, you know, hit the button and say poll. I put it on my community tab. There's a hundred and something, 105, 110 people responded in like two days. So thank you very much. It seems to be a very useful method of getting some information and some feedback. And the question was, before you viewed or attended the Turfgrass Epistemology YouTube channel, were you aware that the application of potassium may res result in increased disease on turf? And it was around 85% said, I was not aware of this. And about 10 or 15% said, yes, they were aware of it. So, you know, that is to me motivation to keep doing what I'm doing. So 85% didn't know this. To me, that's impact. And that's what motivates me to, to know I'm having a positive impact on the turf grass industry. Knowing that 85 people out of 100 we're not aware that the application of potassium to both warm season and cool season grasses may in fact result in a harmful effect. And, and so I appreciate everybody filling out that, that poll. It was, uh, I didn't think it'd be that high and I didn't think that many people would respond to the poll. And in both cases I was wrong. I was happy to be wrong. So thank you for that. And, um, we'll continue with potassium on that note. Let's get to the paper. The paper today is entitled Centipede Grass Decline and Recovery as Affected by Fertilizer and Cultural Treatments. You are going to very quickly see my limitations on uh, being able to communicate things in an, in an accurate way. I'm going to mess this paper up, okay? I'm telling you right now. Yeah, I'm going to screw it up. I don't see how I'm going to get through it without screwing it up. It, it, is, it is not the easiest paper to, to interpret. Um, some of the treatments weren't exactly, um, lined up in a very clear way. And so the comparisons and the results and conclusions we pull from it are a little bit 
challenging to see. Okay, so I'm going to do my best, but just understand that I've said it before. If I screw it up or if I say something odd or it's strange and doesn't make sense, then just let me know because maybe I misspoke or maybe I didn't see something. Or, and I've only read this paper four or five times. This is not a paper that I've read dozens and dozens of times like some of the other ones. This is this is a, a, not a normal paper for me to read. It's, it's probably been 10 years since I read this paper. Okay. This was published by Johnson, Caro, and Burns, who are very well-established authorities. I mean, well, I can't say authority, but specialists in, in turf grass science and in centipede grass growth and development. They were in Georgia, and this was, uh, they were, this was published in Agronomy Journal in 1988. So you can go to agronomy.org and go to journals, and you can read this uh, abstract for free, or you can just copy and paste the title into Google, and it'll pop right up. It'll take you right there, and you can read the abstract without having to pay anything. And if you're so inclined to read the whole article, you can be a member or maybe pull the article from one of your local libraries. Let me get my stuff ready here. Okay, here we go. Centipede grass is a popular turf that persists under limited maintenance and is adapted to the south southeastern United States. Because centipede grass has low fertility requirements, it can be used effectively for home lawns, industrial parks, and other turf areas. Under recommended fertility levels, centipede grass possesses a light green color but maintains a good dense turf stand. To achieve a dark green color, excessive nitrogen must be applied. Not sure if I completely agree with this last sentence, it must be applied. I, I have a, a friend of mine who lives in um, Alabama who has centipede grass in his backyard, and I don't think he applies a lot of nitrogen. It says, because he says excessive nitrogen here, it's a little bit concerning why he would say excessive, but, um, my my friend in Alabama, he loves his backyard. It looks great. I've seen many photographs of it. It looks fantastic. And it's centipede grass. And um, so anyway, without proper management, centipede grass may exhibit slow spring green up or become chlorotic and suddenly die after initial growth. This serious problem has been termed centipede decline and is most often occurred occurs within six three to six years after establishment. Centipede grass decline may result from several factors, but two apparent causes are excess nutrients and thatch. We're going to find in this paper that thatch had no effect. I'm going to read this paragraph because it talks about potassium. And the other thing is that one of the, um, one of the um, new uh, YouTubers who apparently is annoyed with my channel hasn't quite grasped the, um, the direction the channel goes. And that is, I talk about all the literature as best I can. I can only talk about it for a month. But I talk about what happened on, regardless of the results, I talk about it. I have not yet got to the point where I'm talking about the positive aspects of applying potassium. I will, starting Thursday night, this one has a little bit in there. And then all next week, it'll be papers that talk about the potential benefits from applying potassium. But they're few and far between. And they're very specific, okay? And in this paragraph, he talks about a few of those. Potassium will leach rather quickly, especially on sandy soils and repeated tr treatments may be needed to maintain healthy centipede grass. Miller in 1979 reported that combinations of low phosphorus with high potassium enhanced cold temperance tolerance. We're going to see that's the case in other situations as well, okay? Where the application of potassium in certain situations on certain soils with certain turf grasses can actually reduce the risk of low temperature death. Therefore, they concluded that the last annual fertilizer application should contain a fairly high level of potassium for prevention, of rent prevention or reduction of winter kill. Response of centipede grass to applied potassium has varied in Georgia, which is where these authors are from. This is where this work was conducted. Walker and Burns in 75 reported that a pound and three quarters of potassium applied in spring improved turf quality less than when applied in spring and fall. In a later study, Johnson and Burns, 1985, who are the same authors on this paper, turf quality was, in, was not improved with two pounds of potassium when two, two pounds of potassium was applied to turf in the fall that had previously received a little bit of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the spring when compared with turf treated only in the spring. So in other words, in the fall, these, these other, this other authors, these other authors concluded that there was no benefit to applying potassium in the fall if it had already received some earlier in the spring. When centipede grass was grown under shade, it responded positively to addition, additional potassium treatments in the fall in two of the three years. 
And we're going to find that same thing possibly could occur on St. Augustine grass in the shade in Florida. It's not strong evidence. It was a greenhouse study, basically. It was a, it was a glasshouse study. It wasn't in the field, but there is a little bit there in the literature that indicates the application of potassium to St. Augustine grass in the shade might be beneficial as opposed to not applying any potassium. And I'll get to that paper next week. For two consecutive years, the survival rate of centipede grass in spring was improved by fall potassium treatment. So there's clearly evidence in the literature where the application of potassium may be beneficial, but I'm going to contextualize all that work when we get to it, okay? Little information is known about fertilizers and cultural treatments needed to renovate or needed for renovation of centipede grass following decline. An experiment was initiated on centipede grass severely affected by decline to determine one, fertilizer needs in conjunction with various cultural practices to renovate the grass following decline, and two, the influence of fertilizer programs and cultural practices on centipede grass maintenance for several years after recovery. So we're not, they're not going to talk a whole lot about how to prevent the decline so much. There is a little bit of that in here. They're really going to talk more about what happens after it's declined. How do we recover from that? What sort of management practices culturally and for fertility wise would be most um, beneficial? An eight year old turf of common centipede grass with severe decline, 50% cover was, was the test site at Griffin, Georgia. Thank you, super TA for the, I'm going to say that's a super chat. I don't, I, I, yeah. Please understand, I don't know what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> Some people get a kick out of that, but I don't know what I'm doing. I think that's a super chat, and if it is, thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your time here and your, your contribution to the channel. Fertilizer and cultural treatment regimes were initiated in 1982 and continued on the same plot for five consecutive years. The fertilizer treatments were, okay, listen up, here's the fertilizer treatments. And this is gonna be a little bit funky. They were no, no nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium, then, or an application of two pounds of N, uh, let's say one pound of phosphorus and a pound and three quarters of potassium in April, or that same thing applied in April and repeated in August. Okay. So two pounds of N, pound of P, pound and three quarters of K in April, or April and August. And number four, was <clears throat> the same thing, okay, but it had twice as much, oh, oh, the, oh, I'm sorry, the same thing. So the two pounds of N, one pound of P, pound and three quarters of potassium in April, and then two pounds of K in August. So, so it's, they applied the NPK, and then the, in the August, they just applied just potassium. And then the fifth treatment was the two pounds of N, pound of P, one and, pound, one and three quarters pounds of K applied in April, and four pounds of K applied in August. Okay, this is going to get a little strange because I think there's a typo in the tables because the way I'm reading this is they only applied two pounds of nitrogen in April, or they applied two pounds of nitrogen in April and August, or they applied two pounds of nitrogen in only in April and then extra K in August, and, and the, or they applied two pounds of nitrogen in April and then four pounds of K in August. So I think the treatments all were two pounds of nitrogen except one treatment that received four pounds of nitrogen. But there's a typo, so it kind of throws me off, and I'll show it to you. The source, I'm sorry, the dates of treatment were the 6th of April and the, the last of August. The source of NPK was an 888 mixed fertilizer, and the K was applied in August as muriate of potash. So see, I like it whenever the research is conducted by scientists who know exactly what they're doing, okay? <laughs> when you're doing potassium research, you either have to do one of two things. You have to apply potassium with the counter ion being one that will not induce a turf response like chlorine in muriate of potash, which is what, what these professors did. 
Or if you're going to use sulfate or some other counter ion, the, the counter ion being sulfate or some other counter ion, you have to balance that out so that the response can be determined to be just from the potassium. And in this case, they use KCL. Thank you. Soil phosphorus level range from high to very high, and they don't tell me the extractant. Okay, you can read right here. They don't say what the extractant was. I'm going to assume it was probably Malik 1 because this was in the 80s and it was in Georgia. But I don't know because they don't mention it anywhere in here as far as I can see. But it says it was, it was interpreted as very high, 41 to 92 parts per million. And the soil potassium levels were considered at the time low, which was 61 to 99 parts per million. So that was low. And I, again, I don't know the extractant. But if it was Malik 1, that was considered low. And it was interesting yesterday with Dr. Woods. He said that Penn State's recommendations are 100 and I forget what he said, 180 or 190 or some, <laughs> some crazy high number. So. You know, these, these things still exist, these, these high values saying, well, it's not, basically, I'll say 100 parts per million at the time, 61 to 99, but let's just say 100, is, is low. You need to apply more potassium if it's below this value. That, that's, and we know now much more than we knew then. And if that's Malik 1, that means Malik 3 isn't going to be lower than that. It's going to be higher than that. And it's very unlikely that you would really see any benefit from applying potassium when the soil potassium level is that high. But again, I don't know what the extractant was, so I can't be that confident in it. The soil pH averaged 5.3 and varied plus or minus 0.2 units. Cultural management practices. I'm going to talk about cultural management practices only because I think there might be some people interested in it, but I'm going to move through it pretty quick. Okay, just letting you know. So if you want more information on cultural management practices, I would suggest you read, download and read the article at full because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Cultural treatments were non-treated turf, scalped to, to a little less than an inch with a rotary mower, top dressed with, say, uh, you know, 0.25 inches of soil in March, low-intensity verticutting in March, low-intensity verticutting mowing in March and June, high-intensity verticutting mowing in March, and finally, high intensity verticutting mowing in March and June. I mean, there's all these different categories. And at the end of the day, we're going to find out the only thing that really did anything was top dressing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Centipede grass was dormant with no green up when cultural management practices were made in March. Soil applied to top dressing plots had a very high phosphorus level of 146 parts per million and a medium of potassium level of 90 parts per million. And the texture was similar to the existing soil. So they did all those cultural management practices on centipede grass when it was dormant. They didn't do it while it was actively growing because it probably would be a really good way to kill your, your centipede grass. I'm going to talk almost entirely about the results in these tables. But again, I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, I'm going to mess this up. Turf grass quality ratings were based on a shoot, shoot, color, shoot density, uniformity of stand where one equals no live turf and 10 equals dark green dense uniform grass. They don't say what the minimum level was, but it's probably either six or five and a half back in the eighties. They generally use those. Okay. Let's get into the, let's get into the results and just bear with me. <laughs> okay. I'm going to do my best. Now, the table four, which is the influence of fertilizer and cultural treatments on the quality of centipede grass recovering from decline when the ratings were made in May of 1984 through 1986. Now, for those of you watching, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you can see it, but for those of you listening, I'm going to do my best to describe what we're seeing here. Okay, guys, let me fix this real quick. See if I can make this just a little bit more. Okay. Um, okay, what am I going to do? On the left, we have all the treatments. Okay. And the columns are MPK and those are the treatments. And then we have like non-treated turf grass, the scalp turf grass, top dress turf grass, and so forth. So these are all the cultural management practices. I'm going to direct your attention to certain areas of the table. First of all, I think that there's the typo in this, in this, uh, in this papers here where it says 100 
kilograms or two pounds of nitrogen. I'm pretty sure that's the two pound or the four pounds of nitrogen. You'll see this up here where it says, you know, it goes from two pounds of nitrogen to four pounds of nitrogen. And down here, they didn't put that four pounds in there, but I'm almost certain that that typo is, it's supposed to say four pounds of nitrogen because it says four pounds of nitrogen in all the other columns as well. Okay, so I think that's a typo, and I'm going to go with the assumption that that is a typo and that this is indeed four pounds in. But I'm going to use this as an example to hopefully communicate to you all that um, even in research, we can design things that limit our ability to determine specific influences. And what I mean by that is if you're intended to go out and say, okay, I'm going to apply no potassium or I'm going to apply this product with potassium in it, you're not going to be able to determine very easily whether the response was from potassium or not. And I see that all over YouTube. Well, you should apply this 725 or you should apply this 22211 or whatever. And the potassium is going to do this and do that. Well, how do you know? Because you have all this other stuff in it, right? And in this case, they also have all that other stuff in it. So even in science, even in, in, in research, we can still make little you know, oversights where the, the intent, and in some cases we can compare some potassium in this paper, but not in all cases. And what I mean by that is we have a zero N, P, and K. And the very next treatment is two pounds of N, one pound of P, and a pound and three quarters of K. So we can't, and, so, and there's a difference on the untreated. When we don't apply any nitrogen following, and this is for during recovery, it goes from five to a 7.4. Okay. And this this is what I'm what I mean when you see this all over the place when when we have YouTubers don't or whoever extension people or even professors whoever in this case it's a published document where you say well we saw an increase following the application of this treatment that's true but you, some people who don't quite understand how to interpret this they'll say well we saw an increase when we applied this treatment that contained potassium which is also true but you can't say it was from the potassium because it contained nitrogen and phosphorus in it. Okay, you're making the wrong assumption. You're assuming that it's from potassium when in fact it contained other elements that were likely to result in that. And these authors aren't, aren't saying that. I'm just using that as an example because you'll see the increase in quality or yeah, of centipede grass when you add two pounds of N, one pound of P, and a pound and three quarters of K. It goes up pretty much across the board, all the way across. You'll see these increases all the way across, whether whatever, whatever. Uh, cultural treatment you implemented you saw an increase in quality but it was from the npk not from one or the other i can't say what it was from specifically okay in 1984 when we go to 1985 you'll actually see and and there was no increase in 1984 sorry when you applied more and more k so that's that's one thing we can say is that when we get down here where we have the the two pounds of N and, and uh, where all we're doing is adding the potassium in in the end of the summer where we see this is all the same N's all the same here and P's all the same here. All we're doing is increasing the K. We see that there was no increase. There was no benefit at all by that increase in applied potassium. Okay. When we go to 1985, we know we still don't see in from these treatments down here that I've highlighted in green. We still don't see any benefit from applying more and more K. And I've heard that I don't know how many times. You got to apply a lot of potassium to centipede grass. And I've heard this a lot of times. You got to you got to apply SOP rather than KCL. You got the the, you, the centipede grass prefers SOP to KCL. How do you know? I'm going to ask everybody listening to this. How do you know that? If you know if you're if you're making that claim, how do you know that centipede grass responds more favorably to SOP to KCL? Again, if you're going to say, well, I've done it or I've seen it, those are observations. That's what starts the scientific method. That's not what concludes. Because I can say with a great deal of confidence, because I sent emails to the other turf grass specialists who are sort of similar to me, and I said, hey, I can't find it. I've looked all in the literature. I can't find anything that gives me any sort of direction as to whether or not you, should, you would see a benefit to applying SOP compared to KCL on centipede grass. And the response back from those specialists said the same thing. It doesn't exist. There's nothing in the literature that says, yes, SOP is going to respond favorably. I mean, if it's a sulfate deficiency, that's obviously a different issue. But the, the concept is, is that SOP has a lower burn, burn potential than KCL. So you should use SOP, which may be true. But what I'm saying is, how do you know? Where, where is it? 
So I'm kind of digress a little bit there, but the centipede grass potassium issue is a little bit overinflated. There are cases where there's some benefits, but you know, it's a little bit overinflated in my opinion, because I don't see much in the literature supporting that. Because you'll see that same thing here where there's no benefit, all these numbers down here that I'm circling in 1985, not, when we applied more potassium, none of them showed an increase or a benefit in 1984 or in 1985. And the actual influence of more nitrogen, when we go from two pounds of nitrogen to four pounds of nitrogen, you can see following, this is during recovery, the, 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 turf, the centipede grass has already been damaged. And this is recovering from decline. We'll see that when during recovery from decline, more nitrogen didn't help. We applied two pounds and it went from 5.4 to 7.1 in 1985. So we saw a benefit from applying zero, from zero to two pounds. When we applied from two to four pounds, we see the decline go from 7.1 below to 4.6. Whether it was untreated, whether you scalped it, whether you top dressed it, whether you had a vertical mowing on it or not, four pounds a in resulted in a reduction in recovery, reduction in quality during recovery. So in, in 1985, when we go to 1986, you see the same thing. Two pounds of nitrogen didn't, on this, in this particular year, we didn't see much of a benefit from applying two pounds of nitrogen. But when we applied two pounds of nitrogen compared to four pounds of nitrogen, we see the decline, the decline even further. So here is why, if you ask yourself, well, you really shouldn't apply a lot of nitrogen to centipede grass. You really, you really should stay in the low nitrogen range, one or two pounds a end of the year. Don't go greater than that. Well, here's a good reason to believe that. Here's convincing information as to why that's probably true. Because when we applied four pounds, we saw a decline. Okay. Now, when we applied more K, we also saw a decline in 1986. We, when we applied a pound and three quarters compared to, say, two pounds and three quarters. So we up upped it by two pounds. Uh, we upped it by, oh, that's four pounds. So we went from a pound and three quarters to almost four pounds. The untreated centipede grass quality declined following the application of potassium. So put this in the negative column one more time, where even on centipede grass, the application of potassium, which is supposed to be, centipede grass is supposed to need potassium. It's supposed to, you're supposed to, you know, potassium, it loves potassium. In this case, following recovery, the application of more potassium than one and three quarters resulted in a decline in quality in 1986. When you had, and it was also a decline when it was vertically mowed, you went from 5.1 to 3.9. Now, however, there was a benefit when it was under high intensity vertical mowing in 1986, whenever one and three quarters was, of K was applied, compared to when, I think that is almost six pounds of K was applied, we went up from basically four to five. So this is the one area or one data point where we did see an increase in quality following the application of more potassium compared to two occasions where we didn't see any benefit. I'm sorry, two occasions where we saw a, a decline in quality. And well, one, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's, so that's 21, so 40, 21 and let's see, that's seven times three is 21 times, so 42. So 42 ratings, I'm ballparking this, 42 ratings. Two were negative, one was positive, and 39, nothing happened when we applied more potassium. Okay. Then this was in, there after, this is during recovery. After, after the centipede grass was already declined. There's going to be more tables, okay, guys? We're going to get to the next table. So this is, Quality of simple grass after recovery when ratings were taken in, taken in June. Okay, so that was in the spring. Now we're going to take the same ratings in June, and we're going to see the addition of nitrogen in 1984. In, in this is the June rating. From two pounds to four pounds, we actually do see an increase in quality in 1984. It increases from about nine to ten. It increased quite, quite well in the June ratings across the board. Okay, so that there is some evidence that the higher nitrogen rates, although they resulted in a decline in one year and the other year, they actually resulted in an increase when the ratings were taking in the summer. But look what, look what happens when you apply more K. We saw a decline when it was scalped, went from nine to eight. However, we saw an increase when it was verticut from eight to nine. So that's a wash and the rest of them, nothing happened. 
1985, we're talking about more about potassium today, guys. So in 1985, when we applied more potassium than one and three quarter pounds, nothing happened. So again, no, no quality benefits following recovery in 1985. There was one negative in 1984 and one positive in 1984. And then we go to 1986, we saw a reduction when we go from 1.75 pounds of K up to about four pounds of K from eight to seven. And then nothing else happened when we applied more and more K, whether it was scalped or top dressed or the vert vertical mode or not vertical mode, whatever the case is, there was no additional benefit following the application of potassium. This idea that you're going to apply potassium because it's going to help recover from stress, it's going to help recover from being scalped or top dressed or whatever the case is, it's basically a wash. One or two times there was a benefit, one or two times there was a, a harm, and then 95% of the time nothing happened. Okay, I'm going to move a little bit quicker through there, through here now. The okay, so during the first two years, oh, I don't know if I had that on the screen. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm losing my track of where I'm at here, guys. Here's that table. Uh, during the first two years of centipede grass recovery, no advantage in quality and density of the grass was evident from additional potassium applications. So, just what I said. I'm going to skip through here a little faster because I don't want to be here for two hours a day. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to do the, the treatments on quality of CMP grass after recovery from decline when ratings were taken in August and September, August or September. So later in the fall, we see this four pounds of nitrogen again result in better quality in the, as it did in the summer. We see the same quality extend into the fall. Okay. So more nitrogen actually was beneficial in the fall. We see one occasion where more potassium resulted in increase in quality from 7 to 7.8 when it was verticutted. All the rest of them, all the rest of the ratings in 1984 were, there was no difference when applying more K. In 1985, again, there was no benefit to applying more and more K following uh, or recovering from decline. In 1986, in the fall, again, there was no response to applying more and more K. Okay. However, in 1986, there was a decline in applying more and more nitrogen right here. We fell from eight to six and from when it was untreated and when it was scalped, it fell from again, well, eight to six. Okay. But there was a benefit from applying a little nitrogen from zero to two pounds. So zero to two pounds, we saw some good responses pretty much consistently across the board. When you applied more nitrogen, once you know, there was some benefit in one year or two or one year or so. Other years, there was a decline. There was a reduction in, or harm to the turf grass following more nitrogen than two pounds. I'm going to skip through this. It says, thus, centipede grass should not be treated with nitrogen at rates greater than two pounds under, under growing conditions similar to this study. The nitrogen from the four-pound application did not cause an immediate decline, but repeated annual treatments severely injured centipede grass. Okay. When centipede grass decline occurred in early spring because of the four pound treatment, the rate of turf grass recovery during the spring and summer was slower each consecutive year when treatments were continued at that rate. So don't continue applying four pounds of nitrogen to centipede grass, particularly if it's already been damaged. Pretty, pretty clear there. I'm not going to talk about shoot density. If you all want to see it, you can pause the screen and see it. Shoot density, eventually, basically it's the same thing. There was one occasion where adding more potassium increased density when it was high intensity verticut. The majority, well, every other time there was no addition, no benefit to applying more and more potassium. And obviously in, in almost every case, there was a benefit to applying a little bit of nitrogen compared to no nitrogen. And occasionally there'll be a reduction when you apply four pounds of nitrogen. Occasionally there'll be an increase, you know, at one year to the next, if you apply more than two pounds of nitrogen. So it's hit or miss with nitrogen. The safe rate seems to be two pounds. If you want to risk it and get a little bit of benefit by applying four pounds, <clears throat> you might see that, but you might also see the opposite effect. Applying, spending money and applying more and more potassium uh, seems futile. And there was some occasions where there were some negative consequences or harm, harmful effect. Okay, the quality of centipede grass after recovery from decline was not improved in early spring by additional potassium applied in August of the previous year to plots receiving a pound and a quarter of potassium in April. This occurred regardless of the low potassium concentrations on the plots treated with that one and three quarter pounds of potassium only in April. When potassium was applied in the, la in the last summer to plots treated with a pound and a quarter, three quarters of K, K concentrations in the plots increased slightly um, 
or it will increase slightly for the, from those applications. They, in other words, the K in the soil increased, but we didn't see a benefit to the tar. Additionally, I'm sorry, the addition of two pounds or four pounds of K did not improve tar quality any time during the summer or shoot density when ratings were made in August or September. So the potassium treatment applied in late summer to plots that, re that received one and three quarter pounds of uh, K in April did not improve progress quality or shoot density when compared with fertilizer applied only in April. These results differ from some other researchers and he cites this paper. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm not going to, um, I, I will just talk, talk about the cultural practices only briefly. The, the top dressing tended to be the one that showed some benefit. The other ones didn't really show a consistent benefit. When it was top dressed in 1985, there, there was actually a, an increase, I'm sorry, there was no influence on top dressing whenever the potassium was increased. But whenever the potassium was increased in 1986 to that six pound potassium rate, there was a, a benefit under the top dressing regime. I'm not going to get too far down that rabbit hole, but um, they're going to sum it up in the conclusions quite nicely. Okay, so if you want to know more about the, the cultural management practices, I suggest you download this article because there's a lot more in it about cultural management than I'm willing to go into on today's episode. Now I'm going to read the conclusions, which really wrap things up nicely. The conclusions. The results of this study indicate that centipede grass will recover from serious decline if two pounds of nitrogen, one pound of P, and a pound and three quarters of potassium, up to four pounds of nitrogen, a pound and pound and three quarters of phosphorus in four pounds of K rates are applied annually. The two pounds of nitrogen with a pound of P and a pound and three quarters of K rate provided adequate turf grass growth as measured by quality and density, while the high fertility rate enhanced color without further improving shoot density. Additional K applied in late summer to plots treated with the two pounds of nitrogen, one pound of P and one and three quarter pounds of K in April did not influence recovery. So the, the addition of K in late, su late summer did not help recovery, nor did the use of various cultural treatments. In fact, vertical mowing tended to retard recovery. Consistent use of four pounds of nitrogen with this higher rate of phosphorus and the higher rate of say three and three quarters pounds of K caused the reappearance of decline symptoms after four years. Severity and increased, severity increased each succeeding year as exhibited by reduced quality lasting longer into the summer and decreased shoot density. This suggests that growers may use an annual four pound nitrogen rate with this higher amount of phosphorus, pound and three quarters, and uh, they're going to say three and three quarters pounds of potassium to achieve recovery, but long term use may result in decline. And then it says decline was not related to thatch development. So, in other words, you can use that four pound rate if you want to help hasten recovery if you want to, but you're, you're playing with fire. You don't want to keep that up, you know. Yeah, you know, you're 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 treading on thin ice. Okay. So technically, what they found, the results show that the four pound rate of nitrogen did actually help recovery in early on, but don't do it consistently. They said that over over time it actually caused damage. While the two pounds of, of nitrogen, one pound of P and one and three quarter pound of K did not produce as good color as the higher rates of NP and K. It, produ it provided acceptable quality and shoot density without stimulating decline. So you're getting what you're expecting without increasing your risk is what they're saying from the lower rate of NP and K, the two pound N, the one pound P, and the two and, or the one and three quarters pounds of K. To provide good long-term quality, a grower could annually apply that rate in two pounds of N and the one and three quarter pound of K in late April, better turf grass quality plus substantial thatch control can be anticipated if top dressing with soil is imposed over this fertility program. So what I want to mention before we lose sight of this is that they're saying that there was a benefit from applying this fertilizer, okay? But because they didn't apply just N or just P or just K, we can't say exactly what it's coming from. The, the, the likelihood is that the beneficial response is coming from the nitrogen that was applied. Whether or not there was a benefit or not from just the potassium is questionable because when you applied more and more K, you either didn't see anything at all, probably 95% of the time, one or two times you saw a benefit and one or two times you saw some harm. 
So the question is, well, why would we apply any potassium at all? Why, why don't we just do just nitrogen or just potassium to tease that out? And you know, ideally, that's what you would do. But in this particular study, they didn't do that. So they have to go with what they chose. And that was the two pounds of N, one pound of P, and then one and three quarter pound of K. And they say, this is what you should use. Uh, meanwhile, that potassium, you might see the exact same response if you applied two pounds of N and nothing else. Okay, it's possible. They didn't, you know, again, they didn't do that. And that's, that's their option. That's, their, their, that's what they chose to include as treatments. But I just want to point that out is that that's oftentimes how the um, normal lawn care operator, the normal YouTuber or normal person putting out information will get confused is that, well, I saw a response from applying this fertilizer, this NPK ratio, when in reality, you can't tell what it's from because you're applying it with nitrogen. Okay. So to have confidence that it's from the potassium or it's from the phosphorus, we need to be a little bit more specific in how we balance that out. Okay. Because the majority of this paper indicates that the addition of extra um, potassium provided no benefit. So this will go in the no benefit column. I don't know if, I mean, I, it's hard to say whether I should put it in the negative and the positive because there was one or two positive responses and one or two negative responses. But 95% of the time it was nothing. So I'm going to put nothing. I'm going to put this in the, in the no response category because the positive and negatives probably washed themselves out. And they weren't really significant anyway, one time out of 40 or 30 or whatever uh, ratings they did. All right. So uh, that wraps that up. I'll be on on Thursday night at nine. I highly encourage those people interested in these morning shows to go ahead and sign up as a, as a, a member because next week will be the last week of free morning shows. And then when I come back from vacation in April, uh, the morning show on Monday will be for members only. I think you guys deserve it. So you guys are supporting the channel, so you'll, you'll have access to it live. And I'll figure out where and when I'll be able to add in the more morning shows once I get caught up on all this backlog of content. <laughs> I'm a one-man show here, so I'm kind of trying to figure out how to get this thing done in an efficient time. If there's any questions I didn't see, oh, well, let me let me look. Brett Schmidt says, the information I provide is much needed. Your subscribers actually care about best management practices and want to be better in this industry. Thank you for doing this. Okay, well, thank you very much. Centipede Grass and I have, and I have a love-hate relationship, says Patrick Beeman. The good ones are good and the bad ones just don't improve. <laughs> yeah, Centipede Grass is, and I, I have a publication or maybe two publications on Centipede Grass, I can't remember. But it has more to do with like leaching and applications during dormancy and things like that. Some really strange, some odd papers in there. Once I and I have, it's more of an environmental fate paper. And once I get to that paper, then I'll I'll show it if I need to. But um, the inner surfaces, you have to figure out what to do with the bags of SOP that you have. Well, <laughs> maybe you can return it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean. Again, hold on to it, Internet Surfer, because tomorrow night I'm going to show a, a paper that shows a benefit. And for, I think for the most part, the next, I have, I have five papers left. So one this week and then four next week on potassium. And I think for the most part, they're all going to show beneficial responses. So I'm going to move now into the, the papers that show some benefit to applying potassium. So it's not all, you know, horrible. It's just... I, want to, I wanted to set the stage because the, the vast majority of potassium literature says what, what I've been showing, and that's it's probably nothing's going to happen. Okay? You're probably not going to see any benefit from it at all unless you have extremely low case soils that do not have potassium barium minerals in them. If you have that situation, then you may indeed see a benefit to applying it. But short of that situation, it's pretty thin. Okay? You're not, you're, the money spent on potassium is probably wiser to spend in other areas that are have a, a more beneficial impact on your turf okay so that's it i'll let you guys go i'll finish it off with some some music and i will be back on uh tomorrow night at 9 p.m i really appreciate everybody showing up thanks so much have a good day <laughs>